Hello everyone, welcome to the Graphics Programming Virtual Meetup. Today we will start the third book in our Ray Tracing in One Weekend series, Ray Tracing the Rest of Your Life, Chapter 1 to 4. In this book, we will start time to study samplings. So, in Chapter 2, we will write a sim simple Monte Carlo program to estimate pi. And in chapter 3, we will use Monte Carlo method to calculate integrations. And we will also introduce terminologies such as probability density function along the way. And in chapter 4, we will start to do Monte Carlo integration on the spheres instead of just one-dimensional lines because that's what we are doing in computer graphics which is three-dimensional instead of one-dimensional how do we estimate pi first we will have a rectangle and a sphere inside the rectangle if we just randomly sample points inside the rectangle some of them will be inside the sphere and some of them will be, uh, will be outside the sphere. So we can get the proportion of the points inside the sphere versus the total number of points we sampled. We also know the area of the sphere is just pi r squared and the area of the rectangle is 4r four four squared. So with all those information, we can estimate pi by seeing by seeing the number of points inside the sphere divided by the number of points total number of points, uh, and then times four because that's that's a proportion of the area of the rectangle divided by the area of sphere is our pi that's that's just some basic algebra i will not go through and here is the code where where we just sample a point inside the rectangle from negative nine negative one to one one and then we check if that point x y is inside the sphere or not which in this case in this case we just check if its distance to the center of the circle is less than one or not and then we just calculate the result how many points are inside the sphere, uh, circle and then with that information we can only estimate the pi. Well, here is another modified version of the previous code where we showing convergence of our pi by running the previous uh, algorithm in an infinite loop. And for every 100,000 points, we will we will show our current estimation of pi and we keep running this algorithm with more and more samples to refine the result so our estimation of pi will be more and more precise here is a demo in elm you where you can see we put we put points and some of the points will be inside the sphere and some of the points will be outside the sphere. And I, I wrote this demo up a while back. Notice we converge to 3.1 rapidly at first, but afterwards to get the, the second digit four, it's a bit slow. And for the third digit, it takes a lot of time. This is, this is called the effort of diminished returns, which plague all the Monte Carlo simulations. That is, the more samples we have, 
the less contribution one sample can make. And we can mitigate this kind of diminishing return by stratifying the samples. It is sometimes often called jittering. And we, instead of taking totally random samples, we take a grid and make one samples within each grid. Unfortunately, I didn't make a demo for this one. Maybe later I will make demos for all the samples in this book. And the, the code looks like this. In so for each sample, we do go through a nested for loop. But restrict, a, restrict the range of the, pos the possible points into, into a fixed subpixel range. And this way, sorry, not subpixel because we are not talking about sampling generating rays yet, but just we are restrict our range of possible points into a small grid. And and for the upper part of this code, we just do the normal the previous algorithm we did before because we want to compare the result. And let's take a hundred million and try the both by the algorithm both way. And indeed, we find the stratified algorithm is converge. Uh, converge a bit faster. Unfortunately, this advantage decreases with dimensions of the problem. So, so for example, with 3D sphere volume version, the gap would be less. And this problem is called curse of dimensionality. So since the book go into very high dimensionals, the book won't stratify later in the later chapters. However, it is still worthwhile to stratification when we generate in race, even though this book doesn't do that. But for sampling in three dimensionals, then it become less important. The second thing we talk about in this book is to one dimensional multicolor integration. So we could have integration is all about computing areas and volumes. We could have framed our previous pi estimation uh, with integration. And so sometimes it is really hard to describe a problem without the integration. But we will not look at those kind of hard problems yet. But we will first study a simple integration that we know the analytic solution is. So in, in this in this case we want we want to integrate from zero to two, from zero to two of x square x squared dx. What what we do is to just do a Riemann sum of and then sp split our range zero to two into some large numbers. And indeed, we should get, we should produce approximately the exact answer we get with as the algebra analytically. Uh, but we we can also do it for functions that we cannot analytically integrate, like log sine of x or. And in graphics, we often need functions that it is really hard to 
generate analytic form more is just plain impossible. For example, path tracing, the rendering equation, those kind of things are impossible to write the analytic form down. So one problem with the random program we wrote in our first two books is that the small light sources create too much noises. This is because of uniform sampling doesn't sample these light sources uh, often enough. So most of light bounces into the background instead of our small lights. We could lessen this problem if we send more random samples to the light. But this will cause the scene be too bright because we artificially upweight those samples. So we need to remove this kind of inaccuracy by downweighting those samples again to adjust for the oversampling. How can we do that? We need the concept of probability density functions. So probability density functions just look like a histogram, but it is continuous. If you took a probability course before, then you know that the discrete form of a density function is more commonly called a probability mass function. And the probability density function Differ, the discrete uh, density function differs from the histogram because where we normalize the frequency y-axis for a fraction and the whole integral of, sorry, not integral because it's discrete, but the whole Raman sum of all, all those blocks should be one. And the continuous histogram where we take the number of beams to infinity, to infinity then we get a continuous probability density function. But at that, at that time, we can no longer use the percentage to, refer, to represent to rep represent uh, at each point because the because look at, for example, look at this diagram. The percentage that we get a sample of exactly one is zero. The probability. But, so it doesn't make sense to say this diagram represents the probability itself. But probability densities is what this diagram are present, uh, representing. So, so in this case, we have an integral from zero to two. Where the probability, the integral from zero to two of the probability should be one because the total probability is one. And and also and then to calculate the probability of a range because the probability of a point is always zero. So to calculate a probability of a range, we need to do some constants times the probability, the integral of the probability from the probability density, or from x zero to x one, for some convenient scaling factor. And since this scaling factor is arbitrary, we can just pick one. And in, in, this, in this particular case, we can use some algebra to say our probability is a scaling factor times r. And then, then we do the integral at
and we we get we get the result two c prime is equal to is and we already know the the original in, integral is one, so we get uh, constant c prime is zero point five. But the next topic is how do we generate a random number with uh, probability density function. Uh, for that, we need a cumulative probability distribution function, which is sometimes called CDF. And we denote it as the uppercase PX. The, the CDF is a, is a cumulative probability of the probability density. So it's So it's a probability density from negative infinity till some point x. And obviously for because we haven't defined probability density functions for x less than zero, our CDF when x less than zero is just zero because we we don't have any probability of landing on the, those points. And for probability of x is in our range, then we will just say in our, um, we will just do the integral. And if if our probability is, or if our x is greater than two, which is our maximum in our previous PDF, then we know we we'll get 100% probability to land in somewhere less than 2. Less than or equal to 2, sorry. And so look at, the di look at this diagram again. The, the cumulative density function, CDF, we can treat it as an area or as an area of this diagram where CDF1 is the area is the area of the CDF1 is the area of the triangle small triangle here and CDF2 is the area of the whole triangle And then we want a function f that when we call it as f random double, we get a return value with pdf um, x, x square over 4, which is our previous CDF. Because our random double, if you remember correctly, is a uniform distributed random, uh, random variable from 0 to 1. So we want to map that into our PDF. And this can be generalized to figure out our f for every possible input, which is f that taking a PDF of uh, C, sorry, CDF of x is just x itself. Or we can also say f is inverse of CDF. This is this is the most important part of this book, and I am probably doing a really poor explanation of it. So I highly recommend you to read this part of the book carefully until you understand what exactly this means. The next thing, the next thing the book does is to. Just sample x squared by our previous uh, conclusions. We need to account the non uniformity of the PDF of x. When we sample too much, we need to downweight. So the weight function of 1 over PDF is just uh, this following. And, and the book have more, the book have more examples on this where we have we, we have uh, 
And we have done only done one PDF. The book also have two different examples on different PDFs that I didn't put it here, but it is beneficial to look at them. The next topic is of the book is Monte Carlo integration on the sphere of different directions. In our retracer, we pick totally random directions, and directions can be represented as points on unit spheres. The same methodology is as before applied, but then we need to put f defined over 2D of the surface of the sphere. Suppose we have the integral over all directions, where where we can see integral of cosine squ cosine square and theta is our direction. Oh, sorry, theta is the, theta is the angle uh, in the spherical space, and we can we can sample it as the cosine square theta divided by the probability of the direction, but. What is the direction in this content? We can make it based on polar coordinates, so the probability would be in terms of the pair of theta and phi. And we, we already used this method from the last book to take uniform random samples in or on the unit sphere, where we use the polar coordinates to get a random, random vector in Unisphere. And now, what is the PDF of those, uni, those uniform points? As the density on the Unisphere, it is 1 over the area of the sphere. Or oh, we can also say 1 over 4 pi, which is our P PDF. And if the, if the integrand previous we define we said is cosine uh, cosine uh, power of two of cosine theta, then theta is the angle of the the axis in the polar coordinate, and we know the analytic answer. In this case, it's 4 over 3 pi. And the code here produced some approximation close to this result. The key point here is that all the integral and probability and all are over our unit sphere on the certain part of the area. That so the angle is what we usually call usually call this area, and uh, thank you for this episode of the graphics programming virtual meetup. I know I'm probably doing a really poor explanation for those three chapters. So I highly recommend you to spend time to read the book until you have a solid understanding of all those topics.